Ani Nindawe Maginaduk, hello, my relatives. Thank you all for uh, coming here today and for being here and the work that you do in your communities. I'm really honored to be here with you. And I'm really, I have really a good feeling. I really had a great day yesterday uh, expressing some of that and hearing some of what you all had to say. So I want to talk to you about our relatives who have roots and our relationship to those relatives and our covenant we have with the creation to carry on our responsibilities as those who have two legs in relationship to our relatives that have fins, wings, hooves, and roots. Because at this time, in this millennium, in this new time that we are in, that is a major responsibility and a major privilege that we have. Oh, oh, okay, I'm still here. Um, I come from this area known as Nishinaabe Aking, the land which belongs to the people, which is the Great Lakes area, and it's where our Anishinaabe people live. And a long, long time ago, these prophets came to our Anishinaabe people, and they said that this time we lived on the eastern seaboard near our relatives, the Wampanoags and the Abenakis, and they said, you must move to the west or you'll perish. That's what they said to our people, which was true. And you must move, and they instructed us where we must move, and they instructed us that we must move to the place where the food grows upon the water. That's what we were instructed to move to. And that was wild rice, our monomen, our most sacred food. It wasn't water lilies or something like that. It was wild rice. That's where we were instructed to go to. And so we have this food, monomen, which means the, the most wondrous seed, the most wondrous food that is a part of our migration story and is very much a central part of our culture as Anishinaabeg people. We have cared for those rice beds. We have cared for our lakes and rivers for as long as we have been in Anishinaabe King, as long as the Creator has placed us here. And we feel very good about our relationship to our place. But what happened to us is what happened to a lot of other people. We're doing pretty good, and then these anthropologists came to see us. That's how a lot of bad stories start, I have to say. And first they came out, and they measured our heads, and they scratched our skin, and they measured across our noses, and they're trying to figure out how indigenous people would fit into the construct of uh, physical anthropology and white superiority. You know, it was really a bad era in uh, anthropology, I'll tell you that. So they came out, and these same guys, one was from the Smithsonian, one was from the University of Minnesota, and uh, we should have known when they came out that this was a bad scene. But uh, they, those, they were later quite disappointed because they discovered some people in Mongolia who had bigger heads than anybody in Europe. So that kind of blew their whole theory of white superiority. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so, turns out you can learn a lot more about people by talking to them than measuring their heads. <laughs> Much better plan. But they came back a few years later and this time they watched our Anishinaabeg people in Manomenike Gizis, which is our wild rice making moon. This moon uh, was followed by Watbaga Gizis, and right now we're entering Gashkadno Gizis, and we have our Gichimanadu Gizis, our, our moons, all of our moons, and my favorite, personal favorite is Anabana Gizis. I like how that sounds. It means a hard crusted snow moon, it comes in March. But why did I tell you that? Did you notice that none of those moons are named after a Roman emperor? <laughs> it is possible to have a worldview that is not related to empire. That's what I am telling you. And that's very important for where we need to be going. So uh, they observed us. And what we do is in that moon, we go out on the lake and we put our, our tobacco out as our offering of thanks for this monoma and this wild rice that grows on our lakes and rivers. And we push our canoes out on the lakes and 
One person sits in front and pulls these sticks that look kind of like drumsticks, but they're both this long, made of cedar. And the second person, um, that's how we knock rice, and the second person pulls with a long pole through the rice beds. And we go out and we harvest hundreds of pounds of wild rice like that. And then we quit in the afternoon and we come in and we lay our rice out so that it uh, can dry. And then we parch it over a fire for a couple hours and uh, we dance on the rice like the grape thing, you know, <laughs> to separate the hulls from the, from the rice. Or then now sometimes we use a little, little thing that's run by a tractor motor because we're intermediate technology people. <laughs> and then uh, after that, we winnow it with a new scotch and nog in a basket or else a fanning mill. And uh, we always have a big feast and a Thanksgiving. And that is how our wild rice harvest is a very significant part of our culture and our community. And these anthropologists witnessed us, and what they noted is that we quit harvesting partway through the day, and then we danced and celebrated our rice harvest. And they were very upset with this and basically said, we were never going to become fully civilized people because we didn't work the way they wanted us to work. And so, they refer to this as an Ojibwe Mardi Gras, an early Christmas, and we're very disappointed in our ability to be productive. And that is kind of the onset of industrialized agriculture, as that kind of thinking. And so it took them about 40 years to figure out how to botch it up, but that's what they did. They figured out how to grow rice in rice paddies in northern Minnesota, using chemicals and fertilizers, and then draining it and harvesting it with a combine and calling that progress. And for us, this was very devastating because we had specific instructions on our wild rice, and we also have specific instructions on how we're supposed to care for our rice. It was devastating to us also because our communities historically relied on rice as our major trade item. When I visit other indigenous people, they say, where's the rice, Winona? You know, they want to know because we are known. We've traded our rice for all these years, and it's a major source of our economy. My reservation, every statistic you don't want to have, we have. Economically, we're the poorest people in the state of Minnesota, but we have millions of pounds of wild rice on our lakes. And so it turns out two Indians in a canoe cannot compete with a guy on a combine, you know? And Minnesota was very big, created the paddy rice industry, was so pleased with itself for having created this paddy rice industry, declared it the state grade in 1977. Only a few years later, it shows where greed gets you, who became the largest wild rice producing state in the country? California. There you go. Three quarters of all wild rice, which is on the shelf today, is coming from diked rice paddies in Northern California using chemicals and fertilizers and is marketed as wild rice. So we began fighting this in the 80s. My parents met because my father was selling wild rice. Our whole family riced. All of our people in our community riced, you know? But we could not compete. And so in the mid 80s, we sued Anheuser-Busch because they had two Indians in a canoe on a label called Onamia Wild Rice that was rice coming from California rice patties and they got to sell it as wild rice. And we feel like wild should mean something. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so that was our first battle. And uh, we went down there and started battling these guys about the labeling. And we still are on this labeling battle. We got a law passed in Minnesota which requires that all rice that is processed in Minnesota, that is patty grown, is labeled as cultivated on the label in words 50% the size of the words wild. The problem is the loophole would be California, which is out here. Today you can still market that rice without saying that it is cultivated. We need a national labeling law to protect and distinguish our rice. It's very much this fair trade issue, and it's very much a representation issue because our rice tastes like a lake. It doesn't taste like a patty. And so we began our work in the 80s 
And my cousin, Margaret Smith, and I, she's now 89 years old, very good bluffer, went out to the lakeside. We're battling these white guys buying rice at the lake who are marking up the price, and then we didn't get the value added. You understand this. A lot of you are farmers. They're selling the rice for 10 bucks a pound and trying to pay Indians 50 cents a pound for rice. And so Margaret's very good bluffer, you know, went out there. We just had a little bit of money from the Catholics. Nice. Thank them. Anyway. And, but they didn't know how much money we had. And so we went out there and we bought some rice and we drove up the price of rice starting in the 80s by being out there, these Indian women on the lakeside and saying, we're going to buy this rice for a buck a pound and you white guys better buy it for a buck a pound too. You know, and that's how we started this battle. We've been in it since, what, 20 years, huh? I've been working on this for 20 years. And you all know that. Nothing gets solved overnight. Not like on TV. Doesn't happen in 48 minutes. It takes years, years to solve these issues, right? So uh, <coughs> we start that battle. And then what happens is in the year 2000, the University of Minnesota cracks the DNA sequence for wild rice. And you know what that set us up for is genetic engineering and genetic contamination. And so we went and organized and had talked to our communities about this. And I'll tell you what, our people are in tune. The University of Minnesota is not in tune. So we go explain, how do you explain genetic engineering to an Ojibwe speaker? You let me know. That was my job. <laughs> you know, I explain this the best I can. And this one man says, one of our chiefs, he says, who said they could do that? <laughs> Did Gitche Manitou say they could do that? You know, who gave them permission? And that is the ethical question, isn't it? This is not just an Ojibwe question. Who gave anybody right to change the DNA sequence of life forms? You know? And so we go back and we start this battle, and the University of Minnesota hides behind the cloak of academic freedom and says that we are challenging their academic freedom. And we said, what about academic responsibility? You know? Where is the other half of that? And you all know as well as I do, you cannot control genetic engineering. You release that in the text, test plot. Those plants aren't sterile. Plants have sex. Grow up, buddy. You know? And most of those genetically engineered plants are sexual predators, and everybody in here knows that. They are aggressive, and they will mess with your rice. You know? That's what we said. You cannot do that. And so we start. They treat us badly, put us committee to committee. We finally end up at the state legislature in Minnesota three years ago, first year at the legislature. We go down and testify at the state legislature, and this is what it is like, and you know this is the case. I'm a pretty educated person, you know, but I go down there and educate to, to the state legislature and it is me and three white guy professors to talk because they do not want to hear from four native people at the legislature because they will marginalize us, they will treat us as if we are emotional and cultural and do not have the same standing as those guys with PhD. And I just want to tell you that because that is the dynamics of this country. We are still treated as second-class citizens when we go and testify, you know? So we testify there, we fight these guys, and who wants to guess the first opposition witness out of the gate? Monsanto, exactly. First opposition witness out of the gate is Monsanto. Says this is gonna send a chilling message to the biotech industry. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Second witness is University of Minnesota says, what Ms. LaDuke and the Ojibwe's are proposing is going to thwart the university's ability to combat bioterrorism. <laughs> we didn't say they couldn't work on anthrax and botulism. We just said they couldn't genetically engineer wild rice. You know, that's our battle. Three years at the legislature this, this year, we got a law passed in Minnesota. The law passed ensures that they have to have an EIS and a full disclosure for any proposed genetic engineering of wild rice. That's what it ensures, right? <laughs> and a full 
report on the impact on wild rice. I tell you this, of, of every possible threat that's on wild rice, we're working on it right now. I tell you this because that's a three-year battle. We're not yet done. But that battle politicized me as to these issues. I didn't understand what, what seed slavery was until I met up with Monsanto. And then I understood Percy Schmeisser, and I understood the hundreds of thousands of farmers from India who are committing suicide because they do not have access to their seeds. And I understood why we had to ensure that they did not patent our rice and they didn't own it, you know? <laughs> and then I began to understand this issue of this genetic engineering. And so we as indigenous people have formed this indigenous seed sovereignty coalition. And with us is, is the taro farmers of Hawaii who are saying, Taro is our older brother. It is our relative. And you cannot genetically engineer and you cannot patent taro. You cannot patent our relative. A very important, the University of Hawaii tore up the patents on taro two years ago. Uh, but I know a lot of you vacation in Hawaii. I'm on to that. 3,000 open air GE experiments in Hawaii because it's so far from the mainland, and the biotech industry owns Hawaii. So we are going back to the legislature this year in Hawaii, trying to get the same protection for taro as we have for wild rice. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. And then corn, our relatives in New Mexico pass the New Mexico uh, Seed Sovereignty Memorial at the New Mexico uh, legislature similarly looking at the issues of protection of the indigenous corn varieties as their relatives. So I say this to you because this is the state of our movement, but our, uh, our, these are our relatives. This is not an interesting heirloom crop we are growing. It's very important to understand that. These are essential parts of who we are, and it is essential that culture be returned to growing of food or agriculture. It is not separate. It has to be the same thing. So in closing, you know, what I want to tell you, I've, I was privileged to talk to pioneers a long time ago. I don't know, I forget. A long time ago, though, OK? I had this problem with the pioneers word. I just want to say, it reminds me of pioneers. It makes me a little uncomfortable, <laughs> just a little bit. I just have to say that, you know? I think that part of this, what this needs to be about is in this millennium, is restoring our relationship to our relatives who have roots. That has to be part of our mandate, because that's what you are connected to. I don't know if you want to be in that pioneer thing. You might want to be in the restoring relationship paradigm. I don't know. I don't have this all worked out. You might have to work that out yourselves, OK? But in this millennium, we have two things I just want to say that makes your work so important, our work so important. First, you all know this, peak oil. You know, I had to break it to my teenage son who's just learning how to drive that I consumed half the world's known oil resources before he even hit the road. <laughs> He's bummed out. He hasn't recovered yet. But anyway, <laughs> turns out, first, cannot squeeze the U.S. corn crop into my gas tank. You know, don't even try. It's not the right thing to do. Got to cut your addiction. That's what you got to do. You know? And second, turns out we can't get the food to the table with peak oil. Because right now they're saying 10 to 15 calories of fossil fuels used to produce one calorie of food. You, know, you understand what I'm saying, the implications of that, right? So that is why relocalization of food economies is essential. <laughs> that is what we are doing. But these, and to do that, second, you have to fight for the water. I don't know how else to say that. But right now, they're hogging it for energy corporations, 
for cities, for suburbs, for malls. Someone has to speak for the plant relatives' rights to the water because they're going to need it to live. Third, I want to say our traditional foods that we are growing out, we have our rice, but we're restoring our, our, our pumpkins, our squash, our beans, our corn varieties. Those really old varieties have something in them that is very important. First, almost every one of those heritage indigenous varieties is much higher in antioxidants, fiber, um, amino acids than anything you can buy at the store. I don't know how they bred all that stuff out when they created industrialized food, but that's what they did. Those foods are medicine. You have to remember that, and you have to treat them like that, and you have to grow those foods, because those are the foods that are going to heal us from the problems we have for, that are food-related, right? I'm saying that's really important to not forget. And second, those foods like our corn, we have some little short guy corn I got from a, a, I got it from a seed bank. I got a handful like this about five years ago. Now we got five acres of it. This little guys, they're called Bear Island Flint. But those guys, they go about this tall and they have great big corn on them. They don't spend time getting big. But why did I tell you that about them? Because those guys are the guys that are gonna make it through climate destabilization. You understand what I'm saying? Is that those old, bio, biologically diverse seed stocks have the ability to adapt that absolutely there is no sim similar ability in a hybrid or anything owned by Monsanto. That's what you have to remember in this work that we're doing. If we wanna feed our people, we gotta go back to those original guys those original relatives. My father passed away about uh, 15 years ago. But he used to say, and I, I don't know if I ever really got it until about a year ago, he used to say, I don't want to hear your philosophy unless it grows corn. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting thing? And it took me this long to figure out what he was talking about, you know? We are all in the richest and most powerful country of the world, and we were all products and colonized by the petroleum era. We have a lot of things that we think about and do that have nothing relation in to, related to our sustainability and recovering these relationships with our relatives. And so, you know, you are all a really smart and in touch decolonizing, I'm praying on that one, a uh, bunch of people out here. And, you know, my dad was right. My dad was right. We got to think about what it is that we are doing that is going to sustain our relations to our relatives, whether they have wings or whether they have fins or whether they have roots, because that's how we're going to make a path that we're going to survive on in this next millennium. Miigwech, meet you. I want to thank you for your time and really wish you the best in your work. Good.